Good morning. This is Pastor Jack Gray welcoming you to worship in a brand new way. We join in worship to praise God who has done wonderful things for us. While we do it with modern technology, it's the old, old story we've loved so long. Tonight, we will worship in the Harrison Community Church at 7 with refreshments and fellowship time to follow. They have plenty of space to spread out as our leaders have asked us to do. So please jo plan on joining us there. God calls us to worship with these words from Acts 3, 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. Let's ask God to bless us as we worship him together electronically. This format praises you, God, for all the advancements you have given to us and enriches our lives as we obey our government in not holding a large public worship, sitting close to one another. In this unusual fourth Sunday in Lent, we ask you to draw us all closer to our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how he loves you and me. And that's the song we would be singing if we were sitting in the sanctuary together. In John 15, 12 to 14, God greets us with these words. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. And what do friends do? They respect each other and seek to live in such a way that the other person is honored. This is God's law for the fourth Sunday in Lent. Please read along with me. Feel free to say the response as you worship at home. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Together we say, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. You shall have no other gods before me. Together we say, in the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me by showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And again, together we say, therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Together we say, with my mouth, I will greatly extol the Lord. In the great throng, I will praise him. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And together we say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Together we say, listen my son to your father's instruction 
and do not forsake your mother's teaching. You shall not murder. Again, together we say, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. You shall not commit adultery. With me say, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. You shall not steal. Together we say, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Together we say, the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who are truthful. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And together we say, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Let's turn to our Heavenly Father in prayer this morning. Father in heaven, on this fourth Sunday in Lent, we are worshiping you in a way that's rather foreign to us. We know that to keep us all safe from the virus that's circling the world, we are asked to stay out of public places there were, where there would be the opportunity for that disease to spread. And so in our own homes, we are worshiping you, praising you, for creating some of the modern things that we have today to stay communicating with one another. We thank you so much that you have given us the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we can belong, body and soul in life and in death. And we know that's far more important than how we worship or with whom we worship. And so we come exalting Jesus, because he is the special one we focus on in this Lenten season. And today, as we turn to the judgments that were passed about your perfect son, we pray that it will remind us that you are not only a God who sends us a savior who loves us dearly and who we love dearly, but you control every detail and every facet of our lives. And for that, we give you thanks, including uh, for some of the things that will come out of this time of the coronavirus. We're praying, Father in heaven, that we may all grow in our grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ during this time of Lent. And we are here, Father in heaven, uh, to pray especially uh, for those in our church family who are shut in. Because today we have a special sensitivity for them because we are shut in too. And we are all in our own homes, shut in from the rest of the world, shutting out of the virus and just staying close to you. And so we remember in a special way those who are living in leisure living and those who are in our Good Samaritan Center, as well as those at home who normally are not able to get out on Sunday, as we are all not able to do today. So we give you special thanks for your patience and your perseverance with us. And we pray that we may be patient with our leaders who have asked us to worship in this way, and that we will persevere in our Christian life, living for the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of our children learning at home, a very new way for them to learn about you and your creation and your world. And we know they miss their friends and they miss the parties and the events that 
are all planned for this time. So we pray, Father in heaven, that our children may also be able to see your hand, even in this kind of unusual setting. We pray that our teenagers may have a really good sense of how we ought to live before you in a time of international crisis and a pandemic that swept the whole world. We thank you, Father in heaven, that our children and teens can face this particular crisis that many feel is the greatest that's been in our nation uh, since the days of the Civil War. And may they learn valuable spiritual lessons as they grow through this together with us adults. We also pray that there will be many unbelievers who are stopped in their tracks and will turn to Jesus in this Lenten season. Perhaps many people who did not otherwise plan to go to church are looking around and wondering how do we react to this virus and they're seeking you. We read about some of our mega churches that normally have 6,000 people in church. And when this virus hit, they now have 10,000 people listening to their worship service at home. And may they be bringing the same good message of salvation that we bring in Grace and Corsica today so that people are encouraged to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Meet our physical needs in these days as well. We may find that shelves are empty, things we wanted aren't there, but you meet our needs as our Heavenly Father. And we pray that soon the disruption in our normal life will be over and we'll return to a robust way of life and including a healthy economy. Jesus was lifted up, not only on a cross, but he desires to be lifted up in the lives of millions of people around the world. And we pray that today we will lift Jesus up in our own life and that Jesus lifts it up on the cross. His blood will cover our sins and his salvation will embrace us and our whole family will eventually arrive safely in the heavenly city. This is our prayer and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. If we were sitting in church today, we would be singing, were you there? Because this message this morning tries to put us right in the middle of the trial of the millenniums. It's the trial of the human history. And we're going to read now from Matthew 27, and this will be our scripture lesson and our text today. The translators call this Jesus before Pilate. We begin reading at verse 27. Pardon me, chapter 27, verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner by the crowd. At the time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas? or Jesus, who is called Christ. For he knew it was out of envy they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. 
don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. And this is our text today, verse 19. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. And then our text today, while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent this message, don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Our message is called Pilate and Procula. Pilate is a name you all know. He is the only man who makes it in the Apostles' Creed. And so every time we recite it, you are reminded of Pontius Pilate. Who's Procula? Well, we know from secular literature that was the name of Pontius Pilate's wife. And so Pilate and Procula were a very important couple in Palestine at that time. What we know is that Pilate oversaw the very excellent Roman judgment that was taking place all over the then known the world. Still today, those who study law study a great deal about the Roman Empire and how it did judicial law because it was such an excellent example. It's why so many law buildings have Roman architecture with these big columns because it reflects the fact that we would like in the United States of America to have the same kind of good judicial statements that came out of the Roman Empire. And well, Pilate's wife, Procula, she was a very special person too, and really a very special person in Pilate's life. But before we get to Pilate and Procula, we ought to look back at a mirror. And this is the rear view mirror of the car. And I know that you teenagers who are taking driver's training are taught that you've got to look out the windshield and that's got to be your primary focus. But you always out of the corner of your eye have to keep on looking at the rear view mirror because that too is really important. And so we're going to begin by reviewing how the judicial system of that day worked. When Jesus was first taken out of the Garden of Gethsemane, he was taken to Annas, who was the former high priest. And this was like a preliminary hearing that we would have in our courts today. Now, this preliminary hearing is described for us in John 18. We're going to read it. Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died uh, for the people. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews gathered. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. 
When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. And so the second trial was Caiaphas, the high priest. And he's the one who said it was good for one man to die for the people, as we read in John 14, 18, 14. Then we read in Mark 14, they took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, elders and teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warned himself of the fire. So now we know uh, that Peter was observing what was going on. He wasn't present in the courtroom. He wasn't present in the Sanhedrin, but he knew that Jesus was on trial. And so the third step in the trial was the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish synod. And Peter is observing what's going on. Now, this is the place where they first declared Jesus worthy of death. And let's read about that in Matthew 26. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming down on the clouds of heaven. When the high priest heard this, he tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? The high priest, we read in Matthew, Mark 14, tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. Now, they were not permitted to kill anyone. They had to have the Roman Empire do the killing. And so they had to now take him to Pilate. And so we read in Mark's gospel, very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin reached a decision. They bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Now we're in the fourth trial. We're still in the rear view mirror. Pilate is the Roman judge. Now Pilate had the ability to give the death penalty. And we should pause just a moment before we read from Luke 23 that we know from secular history that Pilate at this very time was up for a promotion to be a judge in the city of Rome and he would be sitting on the highest Roman court in the then known world. And it would be like us elevating a judge to be on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. So Pilate is up for this big promotion to go to Rome. He and uh, Proculate will have a wonderful life there. He will be honored because he's on the Supreme Court and he's now going to be confronted with this situation 
of Jesus being brought into his courtroom to be judged. Let's read about that now in Luke 23. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge in this man. Let's just look at this one line again. Bible scholars have a lot of different opinion about how Jesus worded his answer. What was the inflection in his voice? Was it, yes, it is as you say? Or was it, yes, it is as you say? Or could have possibly been kind of fatalistic. Yes, it is as you say. So we don't know if the answer that Jesus gave is saying, Pilate, you're calling your, me king of the Jews, but I'm not saying that I'm king of the Jews. Or is he saying, yes, I am the king of the Jews. Or am I just saying, well, that's what people say about me. So the inflection of the voice of Jesus is something that we do not know. And it leads to a lot of speculation. Well, let's continue now. But instead, he stirs up the people over all Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. That's Luke 23, 1 to 5. Well, Pilate doesn't want to get tangled in this Jewish problem. And so when he hears that he's from Galilee, he thinks, oh good, I will send him to Herod, who just happened to be in Jerusalem at that time. Usually Herod was not there, but he could send him over there. And Herod, of course, was the ruler of Galilee. He was the same one who, of course, wanted to end Christ's life when Christ was born. And this whole line of Herods were very evil people. So Pilate dodges by delegating to Herod. Then we read in Luke 23, 6 to 12. And hearing this, Pilate asked if uh, the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were saying, sitting there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. We've all heard about how your enemy and his enemy makes us friends because we have a common enemy. And the common enemy now for both Pilate and Herod was Jesus. And he was here before Pilate the second time. And let's go and see and remind ourselves what was going to happen now. We had three religious judges, and now we have three Roman judgments. So we had Annas, then we had the uh, one who was uh, Caiaphas, and then we had the Sanhedrin, and then we had Pilate, and then we had Herod, and now we're back at Pilate. And now we're gonna go and see how Pilate's judgment is influenced by his marriage. So think about marriage now. It was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. 
So when the crowd gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. Now, notice what God in heaven is doing. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Here's our text. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Now, this marriage of Pilate and Procula was the kind of messy, uh, marriage that Gary Smalley writes about. This is a Pilate, you know, he's a tough guy, he's a great judge, but he's a very kind person to his wife. And so he sends her flowers. He remembers their anniversary. Uh, he does special things for her. And in return, she has complete access to Pilate. She's not the kind of wife who had just had to stay in the background and didn't have to be concerned about things. Pilate shared with her and said, you know, what, what's your opinion? Well, what do you think we should do? And so they were truly partners. And they were this kind of ideal marriage that Christian counselors talk about. So here we have Procula, who unlike many wives in that time and many wives today as well, wouldn't dare influence a court decision or communicate with their spouse on the judgment seat. Oh no, he's too busy. I'll just tell him when I when he gets home. No, Procula says, our marriage is so good that I know that even though Pilate has this demanding decision to make about Jesus, I'm going to share my opinion with him. So now the court needs to have a recess so that this messenger from Procula can talk to Pilate. And Pilate can think a little bit, and then he can send back to Procula. Yeah, I think, like you do, that I really shouldn't have anything to do with this man. He's an innocent man, so I should be letting him go. Uh, you and I are on the same page on this, Procula. So these are all the kinds of things that are happening. Well, we know what a court recess is like today in the 20th century, and it's at, le at least 15 minutes. And so that gave this time for the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. So when Pilate comes back now from the court recess, he says, which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor, Barabbas. They answered, well, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. So Pilate and Procula, the quality marriage, it costs Pilate his promotion to Rome. But God's judgment plan was the plan that prevailed that day. Because God wanted his son Christ to be declared innocent three times by the religious rulers and three times by the secular court of Rome, the best judicial system ever devised, so that we would know that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life and he went to the cross, an innocent man, so that his blood could be shed for us. God used a quality marriage a really deep love relationship between Pilate and Procula to accomplish his will. If we go on, we can sort of think about it this way. God did the impossible. 
he got six courts to declare his son sinless, and he got the best judicial system ever devised to crucify Christ. Pilate and Procula. We could also say that the subtitle to this message is Providence Pictured or Providence Prevails because in this message we discover that God's plan is always the one that prevails. The innocent Lamb of God is crucified on the cross because Pilate and Procula had such a great marriage. Pilate certified for God that his son was innocent. Pilate, in a sense, stood there speaking God's pronouncement. I wash my hands because this man is innocent. And your blood be on you and on your children because that's what you've asked for. And that's why Pontius Pilate has made the Apostles' Creed and why along with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we say every time we confess the Creed that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, the man who declared him innocent, yet condemned him to die. That's the way it was in Gabbatha that day, the judgment pavement of Pilate. And that's the way it is, March 22, 2020. God's plan always prevails. Father in heaven, we thank you that your plan always prevails. It did for our salvation in Jesus Christ, and it will prevail and the virus that we're facing in the world today. Never has there been a season of Lent quite like this, and we trust there never will be again. But we know that you, with your perfect providence, have everything in your hands. Our world does belong to you. You do control everything from the timing of Procula's messenger to the dream that you sent her to Pilate's prominent position, your declaration of Jesus' innocence and his crucifixion, shedding his blood for our sins means all the world to us. We thank you so much for sending your son Jesus and willing to let him suffer and die for us. Thank you that we can look beyond the crucifixion and see the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If we were sitting together in church, we would be singing what will you do with Jesus? And that is the question that all of us need to answer after we've heard about Pilate's declaration of Jesus' innocence, yet condemning him to be crucified. What will you personally do with Jesus? God now gives you his blessing for this day. This blessing comes from Philippians 4, verse 7. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And may you have a very blessed day. Remember that we said in the law, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you.